man, I'm already preaching. I'm on fire. This is good. And I worked the offering in so well. I'm so proud of myself. Thank you, Charlie. Hey, if you don't know how to encourage yourself, I just, you know, I encourage you to practice. If someone else won't recognize your accomplishment, you know, your arm's not too short. <laughs> there you go. You know, I do it often enough, I'm sure. So where we left off, um, who you believe in matters and what you believe about him matters. And so, for instance, you may, God does honor your faith and he knows your heart. If you're being sincere, if you're doing something as an act of faith and it's misdirected because you're a son and a daughter, God, through circumstances, if you're not listening closely enough, he can guide your steps into doing the right thing. Um, but sometimes we put our faith in the wrong places. Has anyone in this room ever put their faith in the wrong person where they didn't follow through and they broke your heart or they just left you hanging? I, I, I've only got one person here who trusted in the wrong person in their life. Okay, thank you. I, I, I really encourage honesty. <laughs> so, you know, I, I remember uh, during the Reagan administration, I'm, I'm dating myself a little bit, he made a national call for uh, organ donors. And organ donors are still a significant need in our country. There's been some progress made, but it hasn't really been fully solved. But it was a, a national campaign, and some people got very enthusiastic about it. And one man even replied to that call, and he offered to donate one of his livers. Anyone sense a problem? He only has one liver. His, his heart was good. He was being very sincere, but for him to donate his liver meant he was going to die. So just being sincere, you can still be sincerely wrong. So, you know, knowing that you're putting your faith and your trust in God, who is the ultimate trustworthy person, is very important. And uh, so, you know, from there... I, I, in the context of our verse, that he's a rewarder of those who seek him, it reminded me of James 4, 8. And man, this is such a powerful verse for you to apply your faith to. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. How many of you believe that in your time of need, when the crisis is around, that I don't know about you, but when it's dark around me, when there's oppression, when there are people who are filled with doubt, when there's not an atmosphere of faith, there are times, uh, even in spiritual warfare, where the word of God just sounds sort of flat. And prayers really don't sound that powerful. And worship, uh, you know, is something you're doing out of obedience, but it's not like your heart is actually overflowing. In fact, what does Psalms 103 say? It says, bless the Lord, O my soul. Anybody ever have a spiritual temper tantrum? Anybody have a terrible, rotten, lousy day where you don't feel like praising God? And then you force yourself anyway? He still deserves my praise. On my worst day, he died for me. On my worst day, he saved me. On my worst day, he's got a better plan for my life than I've got for myself. Amen. And so I have made myself praise. And by the way, have you ever noticed the alignment that starts happening with your heart? All of a sudden, you start talking about who he is instead of who you are. And whoo, there's hope again right? So that's partly drawing near. You're drawn near by faith, and over time, those are powerful actions that you're putting into place in prayer, in the Word, in the declaration of His Word, in praise and worship, and then all of a sudden, you've opened the door where He can draw near to you, and you can be aware of Him and receive the reward of His presence and His voice in your life. So, uh, the second part of this, without faith, it's impossible to please God. That's, that's convicting. Is, is that, can that really be true? If you do really nice things, but you're not doing it in faith, you're doing it because somebody guilted you into it, you're doing it out of doubt, it actually doesn't please God. That's, that seems hard, but it gets worse. Um, Romans 14.23 says, but whoever doubts is condemned if he eats. Pause for a moment. This is, Romans 14 is a crazy passage in the Bible. It actually turns the traditional church, I believe, on its head. It talks about people who are doing things like eating meat sacrificed to idols or observing certain holidays. Some people do it and some people don't do it. Concerning disputable matters of faith, it says each person should be fully convinced that what they're doing, they're doing for God. So, um, Kimberly may have grace to do something in her life that I don't have the grace for. 
And uh, I may have the grace to be able to do something that Debbie can't do. And we're not supposed to judge each other over all of that. We're supposed to be doing it as unto the Lord individually. We're supposed to be doing it by faith. That's the context of this verse. So it continues on. Uh, he who eats, who doesn't do it by faith is condemned. Uh, because he eats, uh, because the eating is not from faith. Now hear this. For whoever does, whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. Holy cow. Now, by the way, this isn't like uh, faith concerning salvation. This is faith concerning the steps that you're taking, the things that you're doing. If you're doing things and you're not sure God would have you do them, he's not directing you to do them, he's not going to be able to bless them the same way right? And especially if you're doing things that you already know are wrong and you're choosing to do them anyway, wow, well, Lucy, you've got a little repenting to do, you know? Ho! Oh. So this verse, it, I, this, be very careful, this isn't supposed to lead us into condemnation. It's supposed to lead us into a relationship with him. You cannot live by rules. You cannot live with a one-size fits all i don't watch tv so that's it angie no more tv for you because god's not letting me he's not going to let you hon because you know we're both in the kingdom and it's a kingdom without tv darn it i mean it doesn't work that way you, you you've got to hear from your relationship what it is he's doing and what it is he's saying um so i thought while we're talking about the nature of faith that we should go to the classic verse that many of you are familiar with it's also in hebrews hebrews chapter one now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. So it's not faith if you already have the answer. If the provision has already come, you're still not trusting him for something that you don't have yet, right? That's kind of the, the nature. I love the, the word there, faith. There are a couple of different emphases. One of it means uh, to be fully persuaded. So if you are fully persuaded that God exists and that God is good and you're fully persuaded that he's set a promise over you, he's called you to do something, then what you do, because you believe it with your whole heart, what? It changes your behavior. You step out and respond in obedience to what he's guiding and leading you in. Isn't that good? But it also, there's another element to what this kind of faith is about. It's um, people who greet the promise of God in their heart. So think about our, our father of faith, Abraham. God shows up. You're going to be a father of many nations. He, his heart welcomed that promise. He actually greeted what God said and with faith. He was fully persuaded. Well, God, if you're saying that, it must be true. And so I'm going to go. I'm going to step out of everything I know, all the safety and provision that I have. I'm going to go somewhere and be a stranger and a foreigner. I'm going to just walk on that promise because my heart greeted your word with trust. Isn't that good? And then Abraham goes even further than that. And this is a very interesting shadow of something to come because in that intense walk with God, God at one point said, I, I'm going to give you a son. And then that promise is fulfilled. And then God says, now give me your son. Remember the story? And so there's Abraham. Here's the promise that God's given me. God's asking me to put it on the altar and give it back to him and kill my son. Sound like anything familiar? Did God the Father have to kill his son to fulfill his promise? And Abraham believes so deeply that God can even resurrect my son if I kill him, if that's what God wants to do. But I don't know. It's not rational. I'm walking by faith, not by what is seen. That's why he's the father of our faith. It's incredible. So in this passage, though, it's very interesting to me. Um, the, the message for this sermon, by the way, uh, is basically by faith. Because Hebrews 11 are all of the superstars of faith and what they did, how they trusted God, how they stepped out, what they heard from God, and their response of obedience. And uh, I thought the first one that they would mention in that uh, in, the, in, that, in that list would be Abraham, but it's not. It's interesting to me. The first one that's mentioned as the heroes of faith is Hebrews 4.11. It says, by faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. 
by faith. God loves when we take a step of faith and make a sacrifice. We risk ourselves. We risk loss. We risk financially. We risk our, our reputation. Whatever it is, we sacrifice something. And Abel knew the father well enough. He knew the kind of sacrifice God had already instructed him to give. And he offered it. And God put favor on it. God accepted it. Cain, on the other hand, didn't offer God the sacrifice the way he wanted it. He didn't really do it in faith. He did it the way he wanted to do it. And God wasn't able to accept it the same way. And what did it lead to? Jealousy. You know, frustration, anger, hatred, murder. But what's the most interesting part to me about human nature that's revealed in this story is there's Cain, his sacrifice isn't accepted, he gets angry, but before anyone is murdered, before hatred gets a chance to fully take root, God intervenes as a good father, and he confronts Cain. And, you know, why are you so downcast? And what's going on? And, but he says the most incredible thing about human nature and spiritual truth, I, I believe. He, in, he intervenes with Cain, and he goes, Cain, if you do what is right, won't your countenance be lifted? Is God asking you to do something you're not capable of doing? Never. All he's asking you to do is the thing that you believe by faith is the most like what God would do, whatever he would want of you. And by the way, he, anything he calls you or commissions you to do, he empowers you to succeed in. And so, guys, think about it. Here's Cain just on the edge of murder, and God says, Cain, just do what I would do. Just act like I act. Walk in my ways. Just do the right thing. And there'll be hope in your heart for tomorrow. You're, you'll have a smile on your face. You'll feel good about yourself. Your circumstances won't change. You will change. Amen? So, guys, I was holding on to this verse years ago when Lori and I were newly married. We had very young kids. I had a career that was going okay. And I will remember for the rest of my life, any of you ever have a terrible, rotten, lousy, no good day that you don't think you can handle? I have one of those. And so we had just finished a big campaign in Vancouver. We, uh, uh, a week after, we had sold a whole bunch of these dining cards to a restaurant in Vancouver. The restaurant closed. And they thought, is this a scam? Did your marketing firm know? And I was the marketing director. So this is like one of the worst public relation things you could possibly face. I got called by the attorney general. That's not fun. I got called by the media. It's like, this is a disaster. And by the way, just for fun, the same day, the transmission went out on our van. We had one vehicle. It's how we got our kids around. And we didn't have the money in our account to pay for a new transmission. That's a bad day. I think in anybody's book. And me, of course, being such an admirable man of God, a man of faith, I come home, I'm totally overwhelmed, I lay down on the couch, and I fall asleep to avoid my problems. And I don't know for sure what Lori thought, but it's like, uh-oh, this isn't good. He's avoiding this thing. So I woke up the very next morning, and honestly, honestly, I thought about Cain and Abel. God, all I can do is what's right. So I got up early. I called the attorney general. I called the media outlets I needed to call. I called a mechanic. How much is it going to cost to get our car towed? How much is it going to cost to get this transmission replaced? Let me ask you, by the end of the day, had my circumstances changed at all? No. The van wasn't fixed, and I had weeks worth of hard work dealing with the public relations part of this thing for our advertising firm. But by the end of the day, my circumstances hadn't changed. I had. I felt good because I stepped out in faith to deal in a practical way with the challenges in front of me. I knew God would have my back and I had a smile on my face because it's like, you know what? All I have to do tomorrow is get up and do what is right to the best of my ability and trust God with it. Amen? Guys, that's a pretty intense story. This is real life. These aren't just doctrines or theories. This is warfare. This is life. And then, you know, ugh. Anyway, this is living out faith. Oh, so what I really want to end on is one last story. Uh, and this uh, is very 
uh, real. It's very spiritual warfare oriented. And it really, again, is a g- walking in faith in your relationship, trusting with God in your daily circumstances. And so at our old church, we had a catastrophe. A man tried to actually murder his wife and hide it. And then we didn't know any of this, but the church leadership was under suspicion of obstructing justice, that we knew there were problems and we were concealing them and this, that, and the other thing. And I was on point. It was my job to deal with the uh, district attorney, two detectives, with the media. I mean, in terms of ministry, this is about as bad a disaster as you can face. It's only murder or attempted murder, but I... uh, I, at the time, was struggling with how to deal with this. And by the way, doing what is right sometimes means taking care of yourself. When you're going through a hard time, I didn't feel like eating. My mind was racing. I had a hard time sleeping. I had to physically exercise to try to get rid of some of the stress that I was under. That's part of doing right. Because if you don't take care of yourself, you can go nutsy cuckoo pretty quick, you know, from not eating, right? Right? And so during that time, in the middle of the battle, uh, I was taking a walk with my son Josh to just kind of get some exercise and kind of de-stress a little bit. And so we're walking by Multnomah University, and I'm walking along, and then all of a sudden I had, this was a common experience in this season, my heart got clutched with fear. Have you been overwhelmed with anxiety that something really bad was just about to happen? Ne- never, Kimberly? Oh, yeah, Okay. I'm going, she's like, no, not me. I walk in peace all the time. Anyway, my, I, my heart clu- you know, clutched with fear. And then just as it, it hit me again, and, uh, and then my son Josh, he'd go, Dad, do you ever struggle with fear? And I thought, who is this twerp? You know, <laughs> how does he know? And I go, well, yeah, I do, Josh, sometimes. But you know what I do? I just decide. I'm going to do what's right. I'm going to do the best that I know how to do and I believe Jesus has my back. The minute I said Jesus has my back, I felt this fear instantly release, and I don't know how to explain this, but I felt a swoosh, just like whoosh, and the fear went shooting out the top of my head. I was like, oh, okay. you know. And I was used to fighting fear like that. So then we walk another minute or two, and then Josh goes, uh, hey, Dad, you remember when I asked you about if you ever feel fear? It's like, Josh, that was two minutes ago. You know, I'm getting older, but my memory isn't that bad. Yeah, I remember. He goes, well, Dad, when I asked you that, um, I saw a creature come, and it landed on your back, and it wasn't a good creature, Dad, and it had claws, and it dug into your back. And I went, "Uh uh-huh. And then he goes, and Dad, when you said, Jesus has my back, it immediately released, and it shot straight up into the sky. He described exactly what I felt. Guys, this is reality. This is spiritual warfare. The enemy wants us to believe his lies, to think he's got more power than he really does. But the reality is when we're walking with Jesus, he's with us in those circumstances. And all he wants us to do is respond to what we hear him saying, to what it is he's doing, to walk in simple faith, to overcome all the challenges that we face. Amen? And uh, we're going to end on this verse. And I thought about this a lot during that season as well. Proverbs 28.1. It says, The righteous are as bold as a lion. Was I righteous in my own effort? I had the righteousness of Jesus with me. It's his righteousness that we stand in in those moments. And so when I thought about calling the detectives back, I would think about that verse and go, you know what? I've done what's right as best as I know how. I haven't hidden anything. I haven't done anything that I know is wrong. So I'm just going to be up front. I'm going to be direct. I'm going to talk with these guys with honesty and boldness. And guys, that's how the detectives eventually realized you're not obstructing justice. You're part of the solution. And they came and revealed, you know, all the investigation that they were doing. So when we learn to walk with the Lord that way, our boldness doesn't even come from us. It just comes from a confidence that if we purpose to do what's right, Jesus is going to have your back. And the enemy cannot rob you of the victory Jesus died for you to be able to have. We're not fighting for victory in our lives. We're fighting from the victory 
that Jesus has already had for us. Amen? Oh, thank you, Father. So, Father, we thank you today that you are so good. And we know that you exist. We know that you are real. And you're not distant. You're not far away. You're not unknowable. You are personal. You are intimate. You are near. And not only, God, do we put our faith in the fact that you exist, but we put our faith in the fact that you are good. You are victorious. You want to bless our lives. Jesus, you died to take the curse upon yourself that would uh, empower us to continue to fail. And you released the blessings of heaven over our life that empower us to succeed as we walk day by day, situation by situation, holding hands with you, hearing your voice, trusting the promise, being fully persuaded that you're with us in every challenge and circumstance that we face, God. So I ask, Holy Spirit, that you'll embolden every heart here. And just like you said to Cain, if you do what is right, there'll be a smile on your face. There'll be hope in your heart, God. Help us face every challenge, that kind of trust and faith in you. And we give you all the glory for the victories. And God, for the failures, we just purpose to get alone with you again, to cry out, and then God, to step out again in faith and to give you the glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Oh, live studio audience, it's so good.